Hey, Cypher here. You've heard me rail on this channel against conspiracy theorists numerous times. I think they have caused tremendous and lasting harm to societies throughout the world. You're just a shill who's trying to stop people from asking questions. It's Crypto the Cynical Straw Man, and if I was a shill, then I'm not being paid enough to deal with your stupidity. There's a very real difference between just asking questions and conspiracism. If you already have a ready-made answer, then you're not asking questions. Conspiracism is not allowed on this channel for it is the antithesis of historical inquiry. That's what I thought, libtard. You're blocking those who disagree with you just because they have a different opinion. If you can't distinguish between regular opinion and bigotry, then you're not worth talking to. And just admit your unwillingness to engage with history. Go away and let the adults talk. Here's an interesting thing. There is a fine line between bigotry and legitimate inquiry. So enough beating around the bush, did you know that Abraham Lincoln was a conspiracy theorist? Yeah. He and other Republicans like him often spoke of what they called a slave power conspiracy. Now back then they didn't use the words conspiracy theory, they used the term conspiracy thesis, which is apparently different. And yeah, they did in fact often teeter right on the edge or even falling over the precipice of bigotry. But this conspiracism was actually foundational to Republican free soil ideology. And just like with anything, the ends never justify the means. Having a noble cause doesn't justify the means of achieving it. But there are legitimate merits to Lincoln's conspiracism, though he could never tell the difference between bigotry and legitimate inquiry. So let's talk about the so-called slave power conspiracy. As the debate over slavery's expansion heated up throughout the 1850s, the Republican Party arose with a singular northern ideology, keep slavery at bay. The Compromise of 1850 Compromise of 1850 Compromise of 1850 allowed the American territories of Utah and New Mexico to decide whether they allowed slavery within their borders. This was a huge step, because that was supposed to be up to the federal government. But California had upset that in 1850 by demanding to be admitted as a free state. They had bountiful gold, so Congress complied. Both Utah and New Mexico would legalize slavery, but the extension of slavery became contentious elsewhere, too. Debates about where the first transcontinental railroad to California caused much consternation. In the midst of a national survey for routes, most presupposed that the northern routes would gain favor, including Stephen Douglas. He believed in the popular sovereignty principle that founded Utah and New Mexico territory. And he also wanted to appease southerners who felt that a northern route would disempower them. So he proposed a compromise to replace the old Missouri Compromise of 1820 and give popular sovereignty to the newly organized territories of Kansas and Nebraska. So in 1854, Congress passed the bill allowing those territories to electively choose slavery. While this appeased southerners, northerners thought the south was using its slaves to outcompete white men and become aristocrats. So they duked it out in Kansas, with escalating violence throughout the next year or so, and continued skirmishing right into the Civil War itself. Border ruffians and jayhawkers bled Kansas dry to decide whether she'd allow slavery. The Republican Party emerged in 1854 specifically to support the anti-slavery cause. They originated as a fusion between Whigs, who supported interventionist economic policies, and the Free Soilers, who wanted no territory to legalize slavery. Republicans continued that legacy. In 1856, they ran the California war hero John C. Fremont for president, and their platform explicitly said they'd prohibit in the territories those twin relics of barbarism, polygamy, and slavery. Before that conflict could be resolved, the Supreme Court forced another issue. In 1857, they issued the Dred Scott decision, which said that the U.S. Constitution did not guarantee citizenship to black men, nor could slaves be considered free simply because their masters took them to free soil. 
Along with forced repatriation of slaves under the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, this meant that slave owners could effectively take their slaves anywhere in the Union and flout states' rights to determine property rights within their borders. A year later, this contentious subject became the center of perhaps the greatest live debate between politicians in U.S. history. Stephen Douglas was up for re-election, so an up-and-coming Republican challenged him for a Senate seat. They decided to hold a bunch of debates throughout Illinois, and of course, Douglas's support of expanding slavery became the greatest topic of these debates. So who was this Republican? It was Abraham Lincoln, of course. Though he was pretty moderate compared to radicals like Fremont, Significantly, he'd already shown himself to be a conspiracist in 1847 when he claimed that President Polk made up the territorial dispute between Mexico and Texas to begin the war a year prior. He introduced resolutions to the House of the Representatives, demanding Polk give the exact spot of this conflict and produce historical evidence of this dispute, saying Polk made an issue which was a false issue. Yeah, well, Lincoln didn't get re-elected because of that. But he must have learned from that failure, because during his presidency in 1861, Lincoln hilariously used a hostile attack on disputed territory to begin the Civil War. He was a shrewd politician after all, and they instinctively twist their principles to suit their purposes. With the spot resolutions in his background, Lincoln was already known to make wild accusations, and in the first debate of 1858, he began with a conspiracy theory surrounding Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act. Referring to a previous speech with the first minute of his opening statement, he said, My main objective was to show, so far as my humble ability was capable of showing, to the people of this country what I believe was the truth, that there was a tendency, if not a conspiracy, among those who have engineered this slavery question for the last four or five years to make slavery perpetual and universal in this nation. So what is this slave power conspiracy he talked about? He spins this long tale about slaveholders either bribing Douglas or empowering him through office to bring about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And then later, by virtue of not attacking the Dred Scott decision, he implicates that he supported it as part of these briberies or power grabs. Lincoln pushed this conspiracy theory throughout the debate, even though, as he admitted, I do not say that I know such a conspiracy to exist. To that, I reply, I believe it. So you believe in these kind of things? Let's just say I want to believe. Lincoln actually claimed he could press charges, so what's the conspiracy here? Well, it's intent. He's claiming that the 1854 Act was intended to lead to the Dred Scott decision. Was it though? Of course not, and Douglas trounced him for that, saying, Mr. Lincoln has not character enough for integrity and truth merely on his own ipsa dixit, or an accusation without proof, to arraign President Buchanan, President Pierce, and nine judges of the Supreme Court, not one of whom would be complimented by being put on an equality with him. Because of that, he called Lincoln a black Republican, who was preaching up the same doctrine of Negro equality under the Declaration of Independence. Douglas asked, Are you in favor of conferring upon the Negro the rights and privileges of citizenship? Lincoln later clarified that, I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say, in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. Well, remember, Lincoln was a shrewd politician, and he had in fact already argued for racial equality in earlier debates, so he was actually contradicting himself here. He's a politician, that's what they do. 
Even though Lincoln pandered to his racist constituents, he still didn't gain the Senate seat. At this point in time, that was chosen by state legislature rather than direct vote. But these debates sowed the seeds for the following presidential election. During the debates, Douglas argued, no matter what the decision of the Supreme Court may be on the abstract question, still the right of the people to make a slave territory or a free territory is perfect and complete. This became known as the Freeport Doctrine because, well, Douglas said it during the second debate in Freeport. It basically meant that he endorsed local governments not abiding by Dred Scott. Him arising as the Democratic candidate for president basically ensured the party would split in 1860 along north-south lines. All because of this Freeport Doctrine which made plenty of room for another party to come in. And Lincoln was made famous by these debates. He may not have fared as well as he hoped, but he had learned something important. His conspiracy thesis was untenable politically, and he needed to set it aside. Plus, despite it being obviously false, there's a granule of truth to it. Abolitionists have been referring to slave power since at least 1839, when one wrote, the events of the last five or six years leave no room for doubt that the slave power is now waging a deliberate and determined war against the liberties of the free states. It was pretty clearly defined with the control in and over the government, which is exercised by a comparatively small number of persons bound together in common interest by being owners of slaves. Slave power was basically an aristocracy constituted and organized on the basis of ownership of slaves. This was the basis of Lincoln's theory. The difference being, Lincoln attributed a conspiracy, whereas these abolitionists simply were interpreting slave owners' common cause in politics. You see, they had several political advantages built into the U.S. Constitution. First and foremost was the Three-Fifths Compromise. Slaves were accounted for in the Electoral College, which decides how much each state's vote counts towards the presidential election, and in the House of Representatives for how many representatives represented each state, despite the fact that no slaves were voting. So slave states were overrepresented in that vote. Their ability to catch fugitive slaves was also enshrined in the Constitution, though it didn't specify how they could enforce it. From the very beginning, the scales of power tipped towards slavery. While Lincoln was wrong for imagining a malicious conspiracy controlling these events, there was a political movement for the expansion of slavery. From 1848 onward, that slaveocracy made more and more gains by pushing further west, right on into the newly acquired territories. This is what the Republicans arose to combat. The two major parties of 1848 were not sectionally aligned. Neither Whigs nor Democrats were parties of the North or South, but that changed in the sectional crisis of the 1850s. Whigs failed to grapple with the problem and broke apart, while Democrats shifted southward. The Republicans were the first significant party to be purely sectional. They represented Northerners, who were tired of slavery's expansion. When Lincoln spoke at the Cooper Union in 1860, he'd learned his lesson. Rather than accusing politicians of conspiracy, he instead focused on how the Founding Fathers wouldn't have wanted the expansion of slavery. And that address ultimately gave him the notoriety to gain the Republican nomination for president. Even though the Republican platform of that year wasn't as radical as 1856, it still indefatigably stated, We deny the authority of Congress, of a territorial legislature, or of any individuals to give legal existence to slavery in any territory of the United States. Obviously, that solely applied to the territories and was merely a political statement with no bearing on whether they could implement such an interpretation. But the South was solidly pro-slavery's expansion, so Lincoln was on none of their ballots. The sectional animosity was real. Lincoln had set aside his conspiracism, which made him unelectable in 1858, but the South hadn't set aside theirs. Fearful this debate over expansion would turn towards the states or even to abolition, South Carolina seceded a mere couple months after the election, long before Lincoln could even take office. They declared that, 
all the North have united in the election of a man to the high office of President of the United States whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. Republicans announced that the South shall be excluded from the common territory, that the judicial tribunals shall be made sectional, and that a war must be waged against slavery until it shall cease throughout the United States. We, therefore, the people of South Carolina, have solemnly declared that the union heretofore existing between this state and other states of North America is dissolved.